I can hear it back and forth. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It's like we're in a cave or something. Oh, oh. All right, let's get into some jokes. What do you say? So, last week, in a recent article, uh, the Mass Magazine surveyed PLU students on what they were addicted to. Answers included things like cross-stitching, drawing, video games, and Tetris. What? That is not what college students are addicted to. That is what you tell your parents when you go home and they ask you what you've been up to. Oh, you know, I've been doing some you know, drawing, drawing, Tetris, cross-stitching, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> UW has been doing well this year. Any UW fans in here? Any yes. UW fans? Yeah. Go Huskies, right? Yeah, they get, they get the W. There's a really avid Huskies fan in the audience. There's one of them. Yeah, the Huskies get to put up the W and they win, right? And the Lutes, well, you know, when we win, we... <laughs> UW recently euthanized 6,000 African clawed frogs from their labs because they became infected with the virus, which made me really sad because I actually own an African clawed frog. And when I read the article, I, I noticed that the Tacoma News Tribune put the wrong species of frog on their article. Uh, See, so this is the picture of the frog they have here, all right? And then this is the picture of my frog, Sparkle. Yeah. She's, uh, she actually turned 13 this September. She's 13 years old. I'm a proud frog daddy. Uh, <laughs> I, I got her in second grade and now she's 13, which means that I need to start thinking about college. But I think we know where not to send her. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. According to the Tacoma News Tribune, now this is a real story, a Puyallup lawmaker is putting on a marimba concert to pay the fees she occurred from 44 ethics violations. She's playing, yeah. She's playing 44 minutes of marimba music to raise money for her fees because nothing gets forgiveness from an ethics violation like a white woman playing African music. <laughs> the board then told her that it is generally unethical to charge community members more than $50. So how much did she charge? $49.50! Woo! That close to have an ethics violation. She was almost a bad person. Three of the largest pumpkins in history came from the South Sound this year. Three of them. The largest one weighing in at over 2,000 pounds. That is a ton. That is a, that is a whole ton. Yeah, yeah. And that pumpkin broke the North American record. So the grower received $7 per pound. That is $16,000 for the grower. I guess we know why Linus from Charlie Brown was looking for the great pumpkin. Yeah, the kid was trying to turn, he needed a new blanket. You know, it was getting old from all the episodes. People have started to marry themselves. Uh, a woman from Italy married herself, starting a new trend. The dress for the wedding cost $12,000. There was a three-tier cake and 70 guests. And that's a lot of money to spend, especially since, statistically speaking, there's a 50% chance she'll get a divorce. <laughs> uh, you think going to school with your ex is bad? Oh, try being the same person as him. So, Thor Ragnarok premiered today. It came out tonight. Any Thor fans in here? Do we have any Thor fans? Yeah, we do! So, re early reports of the movie are calling it a buddy cop duo between Thor and the Hulk. While we're excited for the movie, we are a little worried that maybe you might bring up some memories of our old buddy duo, Tom and Patty Christ. Yeah, I know, I know. But uh, for those of you who don't know, the Christes were our Lord and Saviors, and you know, yeah. <laughs> The, the new president, Alan Belton, well, he's cool, I guess, but he is an accountant, so, you know. <laughs> if I get audited after the show, we'll know why, we'll know what happened, it was the president. <laughs> One person is a really big, really hates the, the uh, accountants, that's the word I was looking for, hates the accountants. So, since it is the anniversary of Trump's election, uh, we are going to spend a little bit of time with our Commander-in-Chief. Yes, we're all very excited, very excited. Uh, we're going to see what's up with Trump. So recently, Trump offered $400,000 to his staff for the legal fees surrounding the Russians' involvement with the election. His staff was like, whoa, we're used to lying for free. Whoa, this is great. <laughs> Idaho is apparently one of the few states that was untargeted by the hackings. 
I guess they figured that all 12 people were going to vote Republican anyway. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah. I just find it interesting that even before the election, there were rumors of Russians hacking the polls. And you would think the fact that Russia, our biggest rival in the entire world, wanted Trump to be president would have been a pretty big warning to the American population. I guess for Trump porters, the Cold War has, has melted away. Not from global warming, though. Not from global warming. No, that, not that. <laughs> When Trump was asked about the recent scandal in which he poorly comforted the spouses of deceased soldiers, he defended himself by saying that a lot of presidents didn't make calls. And to be fair, not a single president before 1876 made a single call to widows. Not one of them. Not Washington, not Lincoln, Jefferson, not one. A lot of people are saying that Trump isn't environmentally friendly. He did pull us from the Paris Accords and he promoted the use of non-renewable resources. However, we think he made it abundantly clear that he is all about the Greens. There it is. Which I think proves that golf is not a sport, because I think we can all agree that if there's one thing our president is not, it's an athlete. All right, thank you for coming to Late Night Welcome. We have Stephanie Ann Johnson, we have Nate Bowling, and during the commercial break, you'll hear a spooky PLU story. All right, we'll be right back after this. Four years after PLU opened, Buke Harstad left to join the gold rush in Alaska to get PLU out of financial difficulty. He returned a year later, quote, penniless and decidedly goldless, end quote, but not ghostless. By 1917, Harstad had left the school, and a year later it closed down for two years, perhaps because the ghost, known to students as Charlotte, posed too great a threat. Directly across from Harstad Hall sits another haunted building, the Karen Hilly Phillips Center for the Performing Arts, which is the home of Matilda. The building used to be named after Seth Eastfold, another former president of PLU who died less than a year after retiring from his position. Eastfold wrote several books, including Immortality, Intermediate State and Final Issue, and Beyond the Grave. He was obviously interested in afterlife, might he have opened a portal in KHP, releasing Matilda so she could play with us forever and ever? The final poltergeist, the Hinderley Hermit, remains an enigma, but its location is important. If you look at a campus map, you can see that a straight line connects all of PLU sites of paranormal activity. That means Mary Baker Russell is next. Be afraid. Be very afraid. Not only does it lie on the line, but it shares something in common with the rest of the buildings. Music. Harstad has a less obvious connection to music, but since it used to be the Old Main, it was the only place to put on musical events or teach music. KHP hosts night of musical theater, concerts, and other musical events, and Hinderley is the residence hall for creative expression. For some reason, all of the ghosts hate PLU's music program and haunt any place associated with it. MBR may be possessed sooner than we know. Former President Christ stepped down from his position last year, and the act of calling spirits, evocation, is eerily similar to his favorite subject, vocation. All these years he has been trying to warn students. He even set up a ghost-busting unit within campus safety made up of students associated with the music program, conveniently located in the same building as the original ghost. Campus Safety posted a job for a communications officer at the beginning of the year that practically gave away their secret. Officers were supposed to be able to, quote, prioritize call responses based on department, end quote, a separate ghost-busting department. And they had to be able to, quote, maintain various activity logs, end quote, paranormal activity logs. Obviously, the secret society uses their sixth sense to keep PLU's ghost situation a secret from the rest of the student body. So to the members of this society, whoever you are, thank you for your service to us and to the school. Welcome back to Late Night, welcome! What did we think of our spooky story? Oh. <laughs> oh, wow, we're going to fight them, I guess. We'll meet in Red Square after the show. Does that sound good? Yeah? Woo! Let's do it. All right, so 
uh, while we were reading around in some newspapers this week, we came across an article in the New York Post. Apparently, a man was pulled over and fined $149 for singing too loudly in his car, which, yeah, has me in shock, too, because I do that all the time. So what we did is we tracked down that officer, and we managed to get him on the show. So please welcome Officer Barrymore. Don't turn it down! Turn it down! You're out of town and you're three! Make my mustache fall off! You can ask me a question, this is how it works. You know how the thing works? Yep. <clears throat> uh, so, you, uh, you pulled a man over for singing too loudly. Yeah, that's the story. Yeah. Uh, isn't there like a whole like freedom of speech thing oh, this time? Oh, not you too, Sam. Okay, look, I believe in freedom of speech. Yeah, whatever. Okay, but this, this was violent singing, okay? This was violent. This was, this was madness while operating a motor vehicle. Well, I, I just, I don't think that seems really fair. Oh, but... yeah, you don't think so, do you, Sam? You love to live in your pretty little world, don't you? Okay, this was violent singing. Violent. I could have charged him with assaulting an officer's ears. Okay. Uh, that, there's no way okay, that that's... A... Look, kid, look. Let me, let, me, let me paint a beautiful picture for you, okay? Let me make this crystal clear for you, okay? Okay, imagine, it was, it was, like, it was like a baby. A baby, a crying baby, scratching its nails on a chalkboard, all right? Well, in a tornado, surrounded by other crying babies. <laughs> or Nickelback trying to sing anything. You know what? Yeah, that, that does not sound pleasant. Yeah, that okay, does not. Yeah, now you understand. Yeah, uh, so if you can do this, what do we do if we have like, I don't know, like a roommate who sings loudly or badly? Is oh, you can do oh my gosh. If, if you experience such a trauma, you, you send me a text, give me a phone call, I'll come running. Okay. Well, how do we get a hold of you? <laughs> Seriously? Like for real? 911, Sam. The number is 911. 911. Everyone write this down. 911. 911. All right. Thank you, Officer yeah, Barrymore. Right. Thank yeah, you. No problem. Thank you. Yeah. Come on. So, please, please do not text 911 because that makes no sense. Uh, but what you can do with videos of your roommate, I don't know, maybe you caught while they were singing loudly and horribly, is send them to our late night social media. Okay, send it. We've got Twitter, Instagram. Message to me personally on Facebook, okay? And we can help you out with your problem. All right? Sound good? All right. And now, please give it up for our next guest, Nate Bowling! Welcome, sir. Nice to you here. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, nothing but uh, generic from PLU for you. <laughs> All right. It's rippling, it's rippling. So you are the Washington State Teacher of the Year for, la for 2016, correct? Yeah, that is correct. And, yeah. 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 And, and he was in the top four in the, in the national competition. You finished in the top four, that's correct? That's too? also correct, yeah. Well, Man. So, clearly, you are an educator of a high caliber. Clearly. Do you have any advice for students who are studying education here? How can they be successful in teaching the young people of our country? Sure. Uh, for me, the thing is about, like, teaching is relational. And people understand that. Like, it doesn't matter what you know. Nobody cares what you know. They care you can you connect. And so, like, mm -hmm. kids buy into the teacher way before the content. And so there's this whole thing, like people in Lamp Magazine saying, we need PhDs in classrooms. Like, it's not about content knowledge, it's about relationships. If you can establish a rapport with somebody, you can teach them. Wow, wow, that's awesome. Thank you so much. They're, they're really clappy, by the way. It's, it's kind of it's hilarious. They're really clappy. Oh, it's amazing for us, right? Clapping, clapping, yes! It's, you know, it, it feels good when you're up here, right? Yeah, when you sit. Uh, so you got the, the teach government at Lincoln High School in Tacoma, that's correct, right? Yeah. And you're teaching government, and has the way you teach, you've taught government changed at all uh, with the election of a new president? Do you change how you approach Let's subjects? be real. Uh, it's easier now than ever. 
I can start class with like the tweet of the moment. And as long as like it's clean enough to use, because sometimes it's not. Um, Which, so the tweets from the President of the United States are not clean enough to show in your classroom? On occasion. And so, wow. it, like honestly, the class nowadays is, they walk in the classroom, there's a headline, a graph or something, provocative quote, I ask a question, provocative quote, question, discourse, 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 right, right, right. And it, it teaches itself, honestly. Like, like <laughs> right now in this moment, young people are so engaged and so outraged, and like rightfully so, there's so much, we'll call it chicanery and shenanigans happening, uh, that, that I, I'm actually amazingly like, like blessed to have this job and excited for the future. Uh, this is not pandering to the audience, but like, I cannot wait until the boomers are gone. Like, well, well, wait, amendment. I can't wait till the boomers are gone except my mother. Like, oh, oh, she can course. stick around. And mine too, well, right? And my in-laws, yeah. sorry. Oh, yeah. But like, the rest of them, like, like, there's a generational shift that needs to happen. Like, I, mm -hmm. I, I think about, I think the year's 1947. So like the summer of 1947, Donald Trump, Bill Clinton, and George W. Bush were all born. Like, there's a generational shift in American politics where a certain class and generation has had the, the gears for 30 years, and we've seen what they've done. It's time for something new. Awesome. And it, that we get to decide that, right? We get to go and we get to vote and decide who gets to be the next president. But this is my drum I'm going to be. This is one of the biggest frustrations, oh. that voter turnout, 18 to 35 year olds, is awful. Who, who voted this year? Who voted? Let's hear it. Yeah. Wait, 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 wait. But they made more noise for a Nickelback joke than about voting. Oh. They did. That's very true. And so what, what advice do you have to people like, to get them to go vote? How do you convince your friends to well, go vote? Particularly if you're in Washington State, like, for, for Christ's sake, you can register on Facebook and we vote by mail. There's no excuse. Like, just effing vote. And like, if you don't know how to vote, like, jump on my Instagram. I always post my voter's guide. Like, it's, it's, it's not that complicated. Like, sit down, spend some time with the Progressive Voter's Guide or the Conservation Voter's Guide, whatever your ideology voter guide is, and like, make an informed vote. And PLU has, uh, PLU rocks the vote. We have an entire organization for it. So take advantage of those things while you're here. Yeah. We uh, shouldn't have to organize to get people to vote by mail. Like, it's by mail, for God's sakes. Yeah, yeah. yes. Uh, one person really agreed with you yeah. with, like, clapping yeah, This is not yeah. a black neighborhood in Alabama with a long line. Like, it's vote by mail. We can do this. Yeah, yes, we can, right? So, I have a couple photos of you. Sure. And I would just like a little bit of an explanation yeah. for these photos. Am uh, I, I'm wearing pants and all these, I assume, correct? Yeah. <laughs> We'll find out. Yeah. Colin, will you pull the first uh, photo up for us? Is it me and my mom? Yeah, it's him and his mom, <laughs> yeah. So that is you and Barack Obama. What, how did you get to meet Barack Obama? So, okay. Each, <laughs> each year, the teachers of the year are invited to the White House. But because of things that happen, sometimes the president isn't there. Uh, I got to go in President Obama's last year and meet with him and talk to him and have a very brief conversation where I was like, don't embarrass yourself, don't embarrass yourself, don't embarrass yourself. <laughs> and I just, I said to him really briefly, like, you know, as somebody who's a student of American history and understands context and like what your presidency means, just thank you for being who you were and what you represented. Wow. Did he, did he say anything back? Did he, what, was, what did he say? I, I also made a pitch, so that same... <laughs> Double, double it down, double right. it down. Get so that, that same year, President uh, Xi from China had come to Lincoln High School, and so I'd met him as well, and we co-taught a lesson. And so I said to President Obama, when you're done in the White House, I'd love to have you come visit you know, Lincoln High School, since President Xi did. And he gave me like the, <laughs> get out of here, laugh. It's fine, whatever. <laughs> yeah, as Ob only Obama can. With yeah. The, yeah. So we have another picture. Uh, Colin, if you pull that one up for us. That is you, there it is. That is you and Bill Gates. So for the record, Bill Gates is way less popular than Barack Obama in this room. Just yeah, yeah, well, you can tell that as yeah. much. They're missing him. That's what it is. <laughs> we still have Bill Gates where he's supposed to be. But, um, yeah, supposed to be... Uh, we'll, we'll talk about in the government class, maybe. Is that, You're fine. Uh, so um, Bill Gates commended you for use of Star Wars to talk about civil rights. Is that, that correct? Is that why you were in that Yeah, well, well, so him and I were having a conversation in general, mm -hmm. and it was scheduled in advance, and what was really funny was it happened the day after the Brexit vote. And so we're supposed to talk education, but instead the whole time we're talking geopolitics. He's like, yeah, I'm going to visit Francois Hollande next. And I'm like, all right, well, I'm not Francois Hollande. Let's talk. Uh, but yeah, I have a method in my classroom where I talk about civil rights, where I basically use Supreme Court cases as markers and throw down like, so... The Civil War and the end of the Confederacy is Star Wars. The good, wise, good guys win and everybody celebrates. Then the 
uh, case of Plessy versus Ferguson is the Empire Strikes Back, and we get uh, Serve but Equal, we get Segregation, we get Jim Crow, and then we have Brown versus Board, Return of the Jedi, good guys win. But the thing is, that simple analogy like gets gets to like the, the story and the narrative, but it's more complicated than that. And like much like with Star Wars, like the fight continues. Hmm. That's super cool. <laughs> really cool. So I'm an avid Star Wars fan, yep. and uh, have, do you have your tickets for the new one already? I don't yet. I'm I'm going home. So we have Fair a small enough. local theater, easy to get tickets. But uh, I need to know who's your favorite Jedi. Or who's your favorite Star Wars character, if that's fair. And it better not be Jar Jar Binks. Come on, man. <laughs> Come on now. Uh, but it, it's pandering to say that, like, okay, here. My favorite is the one that should have happened. Uh, Tupac was originally supposed to play Mace Windu. I didn't know that. Yeah, that yeah. was the original, like, 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 plan. But then, like, you know, dead homies Tupac, force him out. Uh, and you got Sam Jackson instead. <laughs> and Were so... You what did, you, what, did you, what did you just do right there? We do that again? What was? Pour some out for the dead homies. Yeah. Oh, I've never heard of that. Yeah. I'm from... I'm, I'm an educator, man. I'm just teaching lessons here. Yeah, I'm from... <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. I appreciate it. So, uh, there... You have a podcast then called Nerd Farmer. Yeah. Uh, why, why is it called Nerd Farmer? What does that mean? What is it about? So I grew up in Tacoma, Washington in the, in the 1980s, and so that's before all like the redevelopment reinvestment came in. Like Tacoma was kind of hood. And like being a thoughtful, studious black person was always the greatest thing. And so for me, like my job in teaching, I've intentionally chosen to live in the neighborhood that I teach in with my wife. We live and teach in the same building. I'm 306, she's 206. Oh. You are <laughs> That keeps happening. Uh, You're just pulling on every string right? they've got. Every and so string. the idea of nerd farming is, is that like, I live in this community, and one of the worst things we say to kids is like, go to school, get educated, so you can leave the neighborhood. No, go to school, get educated, and stay. Be social workers, be pharmacists, be small business owners, be entrepreneurs, be police officers, and I like that last guy, geez. Like, <laughs> and so the idea of nerd farming is, I, I want to intentionally grow and develop a better community in Eastside of Tacoma. Because the thing is, is like, I under, we all understand like, the way things work. If Tacoma is going to become a transformed, world-class city and be like that strong, like, solid, middle-class city uh, of, of the similar size, like Providence, Rhode Island, whatever, uh, it's going to be because we educate the east side of Tacoma. And so my principal, my boss, who I love working for, says that the, the hands, no, sorry, the fate of the future of Tacoma is in the staff, in the, I can't say anything. The oh, fate good, yeah. of the future of Tacoma is in the hands of the staff of Lincoln High School. And I believe it's my core, and so the work that I do in teaching is nerd farming. Hmm. Wow, that's super cool. That's incredible. So we literally wrote down on our questions just, you are awesome. Yeah. Um, and we really think that, and uh, could you just tell us a little bit about the meeting with the president of China, what that was like? Sure. So in 2015, like in September, uh, it was announced that the president was making a state visit to, to China. Uh, my wife and I that summer had actually been in China teaching. And so like when I arrived at my principal's office, he's like, there's this thing that could happen, but it's not going to happen. <laughs> and then over the next couple of weeks, it went from there's no way it happens to like, holy S, this is happening. And so uh, the president of China, Xi Jinping, came to Tacoma, High School, Tacoma visited Lincoln High School. Uh, he got to come into my classroom uh, while I was working with students. I co-taught a brief lesson about <laughs> executive power with him. Um, <laughs> and the irony of that, I'll let you kind of wander through yourself. <laughs> uh, and then they had a huge assembly where basically he announced that 100 students from Lincoln High School would get flown to China. And so the next year, 100 students went on the Chinese dime to China. Uh, my wife went on the trip. They visited like six different cities over like 13 days. Oh my gosh. And like, in the big scheme of things, Okay, before the last election, I would say that the American president is the most powerful person in the, in the world. Uh, frankly, the current president is doing a very good job of abdicating the responsibility of the presidency and like making it less important. And so, to think about the fact that like China's a rising in economic power, uh, the president of China has another five-year term coming up, and like if you're looking at Chinese politics, another five years after that possibly, uh, Xi Jinping's an amazing, amazing like person to know and like to have in a classroom. And what was really cool about it was, the kids were like, oh, can we shake his hand? I'm like, no way you're gonna shake his hand. Uh, and when he finished, he reached his hand out, and this girl just goes, ah! like a beetle. <laughs> and like, but that's awesome for me, because that means she got the magnitude of that moment. Mm -hmm. Like, she got it. And it, it, was, it was, the funny part of the thing was, Chinese Secret Service and American Secret Service are there, but they don't cooperate with each other. 
So, because they're all redundancy, right? And so there's Chinese dudes talking in their wrist, and there's American guys talking in their wrist, and the whole time I'm like, can I just get those cufflinks? <laughs> no, it didn't work out. But no, it was an amazing experience to host head of state in our school. So it's, they do the cufflinks, not the headset. Cufflinks. Interesting, yeah. interesting. Yeah, this is movie stuff, this is real life. Oh, now we know the difference, yeah. now we know. So you've kind of censored yourself a couple of times since you've been here, which we appreciate for our live viewers' sake. You know, we've got people all ages. What do you do with your classroom? How do you, you talk about being relational with your students. What is the language that you use? So I'm very outspoken politically in, in my life and in my social media activism, uh, but actually in my classroom, I'm much more moderate. I kind of have an act that I do. Uh, mm -hmm. I think my students are convinced that I'm a frustrated Nixon Republican. <laughs> <laughs> And so, like, every, so like, literally every unit, I'll just jump back and forth. I'm like, well, here's the liberal point of view on campaign finance. And here's the conservative point of view on states' rights and federalism. And like, by the end of it, like at graduation, they're like, what are you really? And I'm like, who cares what I am? Yeah. And that's great. The unbiased teaching, they get to, they get to decide, right? They get well, to pick. Yeah, I, I'm not going to preach to them like, who to vote for or whatever. That's their own politics, their own business. But like, I am passionate about issues. And so like, the one place where I'll take stands are when my students' humanity is at risk, right? And so I will take a stand about like, trans bathroom issues. I will take a stand about deportations. I will take a stand about like, these things because like, there's politics and there's justice, right? Like, I don't preach like weak liberal politics because I think weak liberal politics are offensive. I preach justice. Hmm. Wow. That is super cool. Yeah. And I think they all think so too. Um, so I have one final question for you. Right. So you have met a president, two presidents. You have met the richest man in our country, one of them. Joe Biden too. So like two and a half presidents. You met Joe Biden? By the way, Uncle Joe is the dude. Oh man. <laughs> Like, Uncle Joe will hit on your wife in front of you, and you're like, wait a second. <laughs> but it's Joe Biden. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm picturing Leslie and Parks and Rec in my head right now. Yeah. Joe's, sorry, you, you were saying, you were saying. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the, the question. Yeah, Joe Biden, not the yeah, question. Uh, so, uh, why, why, you've done all these amazing things. You have a successful podcast. Why teach high schoolers? And you kind of hinted at this a little bit. But uh, I was a high schooler once, and I wouldn't want to hang out with myself in high school. That's for sure. And there's days I so, don't. Yeah. <laughs> Let's be real. There's days where I'm like, my God, I need a nap right now. <laughs> so why, why stick with it? Why stay doing, why stay teaching? Because I get to have a foundational role in students' understanding of justice and democracy. Wow. That's super cool. Yeah. Super cool. So you've met you've met these people in office and you've had these cool things would you ever consider running for an office at some point down the line hell no <laughs> like if, if if i can keep it 100 uh if we look at what's happening right now in like local elections particularly here in the city of tacoma like the amount of like mudslinging and obfuscation and just like nonsense that happens like i First of all, my wife wouldn't let me. Second of all, I don't want a doorbell and fundraise. And third of all, I, I enjoy what I do too much. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Give it up for Nate Bowling. What a great interview. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was amazing. I can take that mic from you. And you'll, you'll be coming back to the game. You'll be coming back from the game in a little bit. Yeah, we'll call you back up. So what amazing, can you give it up for Nate Bowling again? How incredible is he? Oh. Man. 
I'm here stumbling over my words and saying things that can't even happen in America. I don't even know what's going on. What did it, well, it's an amazing literate man. I'm so glad he was on the show, and he'll be back for the game later. But now, please welcome Stephanie Ann Johnson. Where is she? <laughs> welcome, Stephanie. Welcome to the show. Here's your mic for you. So, again, Stephanie, I heard you uh, doing your sound check and stuff. Incredible. You all are in it for a huge treat. It's going to be so fun. I can't wait. Uh, so, you performed on season five of The Voice. Is that correct? Yep. Could you? Yeah. Yeah. And you're a PLU grad, right? Yeah. Yeah, she graduated from. <laughs> so, in season four, what was that like, being on The Voice? What was, could you just tell us a little bit about that? Like, like every other job I've ever gotten in music, I got hooked up with that job because a friend I knew, you know, elbowed me and was like, you know, these are people you should audition for, send them a tape. Um, it was a long process. It took a, a couple auditions to get to that first blind audition. Mm -hmm. um, and it was really, really wild. Uh, but it was exciting to see how many people, you know, from across this country um, had my same dream of, of playing music professionally. Yeah, that's super cool. Who, who, hit, uh, who, who picked you originally? Who was the original? The two chairs to turn were uh, CeeLo Green C -Lo. and uh, Christina Aguilera. Wow. wow. <laughs> so the two important people, right? The two people that really mattered, right? I mean, for me, like talking to CeeLo Green was, it was weird because it was, he was so friendly, so it was like talking to somebody I already knew, because he was disarming in that way. Um, and then, like being around like Joe Biden, maybe like like that something kind of something like this, something yeah. like this, John Kerry, something like this. Um, <laughs> uh, and that was the year that he had like that like extraordinary artwork that was like faux tattooed on his head. That oh, was wow. pretty amazing. Um, I don't know. It's kind of it's kind of a one of the things that you realize as you get older is like every piece of media you've ever seen was made by somebody with uh, everything you've got, you know, hands and feet and blood and bones, all that stuff. Um, so every, every piece of art you've ever seen has been made by somebody no, not a lot more different than you. So what is the difference between their art and your art? Well, they did theirs. Did you do yours? You know? Wow. Yeah. That's super cool. <laughs> Wise words. So you're a PLU alum. You studied English here, is that right? Yeah, that... yeah, English major. But I spent a lot of time at MBR. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> so how did PLU uh, prepare you for your career that you had? And also, do you re regret the English degree at all, considering you aren't doing English? Is that, yeah? Well, a, a couple things. Number one, I failed piano proficiency, so I didn't get my music degree. Um, oh. Let's everybody be sad. Uh, <laughs> but you know, piano is not, not particularly my instrument. Um, secondarily, um, the English language, communication, poetry, I mean, I'm a lyricist as well, so I deal with words quite a bit. Um, so I, I love it. Uh, do, do some reading, do some writing, please, please something. Um, but, but yeah, I, I feel like the friends that I made here uh, at PLU, together over the years, we've made incredible art. And so I really just encourage you, you know, make friends and then get in their business. Yeah, awesome. That's how you get things done, right? Yeah, you make friends get in their business. Yeah. <laughs> so you were a cruise line singer for a while, and yes. most of what I know comes from the Sprouse twins on Sweet Life on Deck about okay, okay. the cruise life. Sucks. So what, what is it like being people oh, sputtering at that? <laughs> it was a good -ish show. It was OK. Uh, what was it like being a cruise line singer? Um. I really encourage, I mean, if you're a, a singer-songwriter or, if, or a, a player of, of any kind, and a cruise ship is not a bad job to go and build your chops. Um, because I was playing guitar and singing for people, I mean, contractually up to five hours a day, every day. And then, you know, when I'm not on stage, you know, somebody requested this song by Three Dog Night and I have to go learn it, like right now, you know, because I have to present it tomorrow or the day after. It was wow. stuff like that. So I learned how to transpose quickly. I learned how to work a crowd. I learned how to talk to people. I learned to uh, get over myself a little bit so there's a little less stage fright when I perform. Um, so it was a giant learning experience. And I got to see the world while I did it. Yeah, um, not a bad deal. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. Do you still do you still still get stage fright when you uh, when you perform, or how was that like? You know, if I'm not a little afraid, it's because I wasn't excited. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, I kind of choose to <laughs> cherish a little bit of my stage fright. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. That's awesome. Uh, so well, cruises, there's a lot of things that come from cruises. Everybody has a story from that time they took a cruise. Oh, yeah. Do you have any stories or things that pop out at you from when you were working the cruises? One of my favorite stories was um, this like, group of French people got on the boat. Um, and one of the guys was standing around you know, looking French. Uh, <laughs> how, how the French do, how they do. I mean, he was incredible. And, you know, Silver Fox. And <laughs> oh. uh, so he comes up to me and he says, uh, do you have a song from Unc Williams? And I said, did you, did you say Aqualon? And he said, Unc, Unc Williams. And I took him in and then said, oh, oh. Hank Williams. Yes, I have Hank Williams. Let's do that. Oh, that's awesome. That was yeah. fun. <laughs> just, the, the cultural, just the divide that created the situation there. Culture yeah. is a beautiful thing. Culture, uh, you know, like language, is all about fashion and style and what we do and what's popular. Um, so I really, I love culture. I love traveling for that, that same reason. That's, I've never heard culture put in those words before. That's super cool. That's yeah. Really oh, cool yeah. oh, yeah. Thanks. Uh, so you, <laughs> you have actually put on your own community theater show in the area. You performed The Wiz at the Ashland Shakespeare Festival. Obviously, you're immensely talented. Uh, but what drew you to do those things specifically, the, the theater aspect versus music, which is intertwined, I get. But. Um, you know, you got to try new stuff. You got to do new stuff. You got to challenge yourself. You got to do all the stuff that scares you because there's usually a lot of lessons in there. Um, and being at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, these, these, people, these people work so hard every day, day and night, and it's not just the like 24 main stage shows that put on. They do so many community outreach events, including uh, a giant like weekend long fundraiser for um, uh, AIDS research. Um, they're incredible artists, and it was an incredible blessing to be in Ashland learning to do theater at that level. Wow. Um, the reason that we put on the show that we did here in the area um, was to, because the Muslim ban had just gone down. Mm -hmm. and, and this was, I think, last year sometime. Um, in the early fall, I think it was November. And, um, you know, I had a third grade teacher. This is why educators are important. I had a third grade teacher who was in the um, internment camps in the Puyallup Fair. And so in the third grade, she told us about this and brought photos and pictures, and this is my family, and this is my aunt, and this is the suitcase, and we read a story about it. And so I think kids are ready to hear those bigger stories as long as we tell them in context. Mm -hmm. And so it was really important for me to put on that piece of theater, which was uh, this wonderful woman named Aya Clark, local uh, a theater person, who uh, talked to a company in Seattle that gathers stories from people that were intermed uh, up and down the, the West Coast here. And so she combed like thousands of stories and, and knit them together. I added some music and we were able to uh, sell out that production. Oh my God. Um, wow. Yeah. Wow. That's incredible. Oh yeah. Did you, so I'm, uh, I'm a communication theater double major. Yes. Did you do theater when you were at PLU? I did not do theater when I was here at PLU. Um, and this is something I think all of you need to bother the administration about. There is absolutely no reason that there should be as big a divide as there is between theater and music. We are all doing the same thing. We are all doing the same thing. We are all telling the story and we are doing it by different means, yes? Right. Secondarily, this is your school. They work for you, you pay them your money, so you need to get what you want. <laughs> Red Square, after the show, Red Square. <laughs> so, uh, and one of the things that we do um, that is a little bit of a combination of the two departments is our night of musical theater. Were you ever mm -hmm. a part of that? Yes, I was. Oh! <laughs> But I dropped out because I am just recently learning that it is much better to work well with others. So understandable. You can always learn to be a collaborative artist. That's the journey I'm on right now. 
And uh, you could redeem the fact that you dropped out. The show is next weekend, and I'm in the show, so you can come watch. Will you send me a Facebook message about this? I, I can do that. Okay, cool. I have to friend you on Facebook, though. Will you let I me do that? I will do that. that. Yeah, we'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so she's going to be coming to Nampt. When we don't, we, we will all send you Facebook messages. Okay. <laughs> so you're from Tacoma. Uh, do you do any community outreach in the area? What are you involved with? Um, uh, locally, I work uh, with a group out of Seattle called the Rain City Rock Camp for Girls. And um, they're this wonderful, like, woman-run organization that um, works with girls and women. But the summer camps that they do, it's aged, I want to say, 6 to 19, something like this. And these young women and gender non-conforming individuals, snaps, please and thank you. Um, <laughs> They come the first day of camp, they uh, are sorted into a band, they get uh, a lecture on songwriting, on working together as a band, on body positivity, and then at the end of the week, they go to a real club um, as a group en masse, and each band plays a song they've written together over the week. Wow. Some kids play soccer, some kids play basketball, some kids do theater, and some kids just need to be in a band and turn the amp up. Yeah. And so, um, wow. It's, it's, my, it's my pleasure to be kind of folded into this wonderful community of women. We can always use more women of color. So please join us, talk to us. Um, we have the Facebook links for you. Um, you know, get involved because the, the next generation needs your stories. Um, and, and the way that you can grow uh, if you share what you know with someone else, it's immeasurable. So. Is there, do you have them like, compete in anything at the end or does everybody just showcase their work? It's not really about competition. Mm -hmm. It's about building community and it's about working together. Because all of our favorite rap groups come from cities that have communities that exist. And I think that uh, bands are like that. Like bands are successful. Entertainers are successful because of the community that surrounds them. Mm -hmm. And so with this community, what we're trying to do is build a community that is open and accepting that will allow people who wouldn't otherwise be allowed to make a lot of noise and feel good about themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, give it up for her. So, uh, what advice do you have for people about you know, like going out in the world, and so you, you became a professional musician, and now you are running things uh, for young girls, and uh, they're getting to perform music. What, do you, what advice do you have for people uh, as they go out and pursue their careers? How can they make a difference in, in their communities? You know, I really believe in, you know, some, some of the words of, I believe in the gospel according to rock and roll. That's what I think about it. And, and, <laughs> Nina Simone tells us that it is an artist's duty to reflect the times. So reflect your times. Um, make friends, go to events, go to museums, see art, um, read the artist's way, write in the mornings, be interested in yourself, love yourself, take care of yourself. When your friends have shows, go, pay the money and go. Um, because um, music has to exist in a scene, right? Theater has to exist in a scene. Like, your presence as an audience member is important. Um, so always be aware also of the conversation between your audience and yourself. So a lot of things. Yeah. But make friends. That's super, that's super true, I think. Oh, yeah. Uh, and in fact, like the way this show happens is uh, uh, all of my friends helped me put this on, and that's kind of what it is. We got together and did it. So that speaks really true to what we do here at Late Night. Yeah. Um, so we have one last question for you. Uh, the, this is from Lexaflex, and she is wondering, who is your biggest inspiration? That is a really heavy question. Um, I really think that it... it I think that it comes from in my family. I mean, I guess it's kind of cliche, but it's my mom. Um, I was 25, and I was, I had, I did AmeriCorps right after PLU because I was going to be a teacher. I was going to be neat. And um, <laughs> some friends of mine that I met while I was here at PLU um, were like, "We work on cruise ships. We got to get you this job. It's going to happen." 
Um, I had a phone call with an agent in San Diego. I had a contract three days later, and my mom takes me to Olive Garden, and we're sitting there, and I'm like, you know, sh shouldn't I be giving back to the community? Like, shouldn't I be a teacher? Like, isn't it like wrong for me to do this like thing that's totally indulgent and be a musician? And she said to me, and I think about it all the time, she said, every time you sing, every time you open your mouth, that is a gift you give to people. And, you know, it, just, it breaks my heart to think about it that way, but I feel like that. Um, and I hope you feel like that when I sing later on. Awesome. Well, thank you. We'll get to hear you sing. Thank you so much, Stephanie. We'll be right back with the game after this. Thank you so much. Incredible. To late night. <laughs> All right, we have our own version of the Price is Right today called the Ohm is Right. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So what we're going to be doing is uh, my lovely assistant David over here is going to be presenting different items uh, that can be purchased both at Fred Meyer and our, our Old Maid Market upstairs where you can buy food. And our lovely contestants over here, if we could have you introduce yourself, uh, a member from the audience. My name is Zadie Better. Zadie Better. Yes. Zadie. So, Zadie and Nate will be competing. What's going to happen is we are going to give them the price of what the item costs at Fred Meyer. Okay? And then they're going to have to guess how much it costs at home. Yeah. So, Nate might have a little bit of a disadvantage here, but we'll, uh, we'll check it out. So, uh, and you can't, if you guess over, it's no good, just like the price is right. It's, right. it's got to be whoever's closest without going over. All right, our first item, we have a single-sized M&M. All right, David, could you show us that price there? <laughs> 50 cents. 50 cents at Ohm. Zadie, what is your guess? How much would it be? Or excuse me, 50 cents at Fred Meyer. How much would it be at Ohm? $1.99. $1.99. All right, solid guess. Nate, let's hear it. I was going to go $2, so I'll go $1.98. <laughs> mm. 
there is one catch. There is one catch. You've got to be careful not to go over, because if they go over, I get the item. So, all right. David, reveal that price. 129. Both contestants did go over. Did go you over. You go to school here. That's for me. I don't, yeah, m and &Ms. Just for your information, that was a 258% price difference between the two places. All right, our next item, a college necessity, cup o noodles. All right, Nate, we'll have you go first this time. How much do you think, or excuse me, it costs how much at Fred Meyer, David? 49 cents at Fred Meyer. How much does it cost at our old man market here? $1.79. $1.79 from Nate Boeing, all right. Uh, excuse me, remind your name one more time. Zadie. Zadie. Yes. Zadie, what is your guess? I'll go $1.30. $1.30? Yeah. All right. Let's see that price. One oh nine. Both went over again. At least we're a couple both of noodles. <laughs> All right. Our Starbucks Frappuccino. You guys are going to go hungry. You got to <laughs> make sure your voices, your vo answers aren't too high. Our, our Frappuccino here at Fred Meyer, two ninety nine. Two ninety nine. Okay, I will give you a hint. This one is a little tricky compared to what we've had before. All right. And how much do you think it is at home, Zadie? I would say five dollars, but I'm not going to. Okay. I, um, I would say probably um, two ninety nine. Two ninety nine. All right. The same price. The same no, price. No, it's not. Nate, let's see what you got. Um, I feel like y'all are getting run here with the tuition costs too. So, um, survey says three fifty. Three fifty. So we got three fifty and two ninety nine. Yeah. So we here. All right, Dave. Let's reveal that price. It's three dollars. You win the coffee, yes. and you can pick that up. Steve. There you are. There you are. <laughs> the cost difference is only one cent. That's a pretty good deal, actually. Yeah, That's only one I'm cent surprised. increase. Yeah. All right. Our next item. We have one individual Cliff Bar. Okay. All right. Do we start with Nate? Less. Yeah. Nate, it's your turn. Yeah. What's Nate? the Fred Meyer price? The Fred Meyer price here. Yeah. One twenty-five. Two dollars. Two dollars. We got two dollars at home. Sadie. One. 150. David, let's see that price. 209. Nate is the winner of our Cliff Bar. Congratulations, sir. Congratulations. <laughs> Your mother ne never said patience, patience is a virtue, though. That was just, no, he, needs, not one. he needs fuel. Yeah. He needs fuel. He needs it for this next question. Teaching's hard, yo. Teaching's hard. <laughs> All right, our next item is an entire pack of Oreos. Yeah, this is a big, a big ticket item here. All right, our Fred Meyer price, David. We have two ninety nine at Fred Meyer. Zadie, what is your guess? I think three ninety nine. Three ninety nine. All right, Nate, what's your guess? I think they take advantage of y'all. Go four dollars and fifteen cents. Four dollars and fifteen cents. Let's see that price. Seven oh nine. <laughs> 709! Yes! Alright, one more guesses again. I'm so shocked that. What? Yeah, yeah. That is a 237% price difference. $7 Oreos? $7 Oreos! Heck no! And get this, they taste, they taste exactly the same. <laughs> He's got a bit of chewy. They better us, if any of you buy one of those. <laughs> I will find you. No, capitalism is evil. <laughs> Do you know how we knew? Do you know how we knew it was $7? Our director bought one, actually. So that's how we knew it was $7. $7 yeah. Oreos? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sweet baby Jesus, that's <laughs> But Nate, you won the Oreos with your higher guess. Congratulations. This is like three gallons of gas. <laughs> you better cherish those. You better cherish those. I'm eating these right now. <laughs> All right, our last item. Now, the person who gets this correct, we will go with the, price, the closest price margin. So I may have to do math, but my floor manager who will help me, she does physics and things. Uh, so whoever is closer to this will get a uh, little, little extra bonus deal. So we'll, our champion, okay? So we have our DiGiorno small pizza. Our Fred Meyer price, David, what is it? Good luck. 3.99. 399 Fred Meyer DiGiorno pizza. All right. Your guess, Nate, I think you're the first guest this time. So, knowing this school, there's probably like a surcharge on a Friday night. Uh, 
survey says five dollars. Five dollars. Five dollars. Sadie. Four sixty-three. Four sixty-three. Yeah. Very specific. Very precise. Yeah. All right, David. Let's reel that price. Two ninety-nine. It was cheaper. It was cheaper. Which did that come out of your mouth? No, it fell off. The <laughs> It fell off, I swear. You're ruining Zadie's <laughs> moment here. Zadie, Congrats you can step you. up here by me. So you've made it to our next round. So what's going to happen is I have, a, I have a, uh, an option for you. Either you can take your coffee, you can go home with your coffee, or, or you can put whatever is in our mystery box <laughs> on me. Oh. Would you like the coffee or to put whatever in the mystery box? I'm, let's hear it. What would you like her to do? Mystery box. What's in that mystery box, David? Silly string! <laughs> All right. Nope. <laughs> and you have to stand 10 feet away. It's in the direction. If I can stand over there, please. All right. Keep shaking it. Fire away. <laughs> yeah, close your eyes. Good. Mercy! Mercy, Zadie! Excellent technique. Mercy! Excellent technique. All right, thank you, Zadie. We'll be back with Stephanie and Johnson right after this. Hello, PLU's late night host Sam Ellison here to test some Washingtonians' geography. We're going to see if Washingtonians can identify the most important state in the entire country, Minnesota. We've got our map here. That there is Minnesota, and we're going to see if some Washingtonians can identify it. All right, let's go check it out. Oh, boy. Um, right here. That is Indiana. That is not Minnesota. That's the land of the Hoosiers. No, Minnesota is this one here. This is where all the respectable people are from. Right there. Ooh, South Dakota. That's a pretty good state. Not quite, though. Thank you, though. Thank you for playing. Have a good one. I know it's like somewhere up here. That's right. I'm from there, so there's a lot. There's a lot of lying. No, that's a lot of pressure. I'm gonna say Minnesota is right here. Oh God, that's North Dakota. There's nothing there. Is it right there? Minnesota. Point at it again. Right there. That is that's Kansas. You've seen The Wizard of Oz. That's that's where Dorothy is from. There. That's Nebraska, land of the Cornhuskers. It was close though. It was close. You got the Midwest right. That's good. So that's Wisconsin. Um, that's the exact opposite of Minnesota. We we're not a huge fan of them. Why you got beef? With I uh, know they have cheese. So what's that? Don't you like cheese? I, I do like cheese, but you they they wear it on their heads. That is odd, yeah. Yeah, it's strange. There are weird people there. Alright, let's head out. Dang it! It's right next to Michigan. Dang it! No, it's not next to Michigan. It's next to Wisconsin. This is Michigan. Well, that's how I remember Michigan. <laughs> I'm from Michigan. That looks like Michigan. That's Wisconsin. <laughs> No, I'm, I'm doubting Wisconsin. Oh, that's Wisconsin again. More people have guessed Wisconsin than Minnesota. I'm personally offended. That is Iowa. The only thing Iowa's good for is to drive through to get to good places. So, I mean, it's, yeah, Minnesota's far superior, which is why we're above them. Um. See that? Yeah, gotcha. Thank you for playing, though. Oh, another Iowa again. Thank you, sir. Thanks for playing. It was close. It was close. See, it's starting to live up. I don't know if people from Washington know where Minnesota is. Maybe they just think it's a mythical land. I'm not sure. I'm from there. It exists. I'm telling you. Minnesota is right here. She got it. She got it correct. You're the first person from PLU to get that right. Yeah, you're the first person. Well done. Well done. That's my homeland. Yeah, me and my ancestors. Thank you. So thank you. God, he's got the hat on top, the face, pot belly, and Louisiana's the shoe. Fun stuff. Your question is, where is Minnesota? Minnesota is here. She got it. She got it right. Well done. Well done. Congratulations. You've won the game. You've won. Excuse me, could you show me where Minnesota is? Minnesota. Yeah, Minnesota. Minnesota, that one. She got it. Boom, nailed it. Have a good one, thank you. Um, I don't know. She doesn't know where it was. It's my home state. It's very important to me. It's a great place. It's, it's right here. See, it's resting above all these other inferior states below it. Am I being too biased? Is it, is it coming off? He got it, I think. It was somewhere in that swipe. Well done, Dakota. Oh, hey there, Brian. Oh, he's on the phone. We don't want to disturb him. It's that one, right? 
which one are you pointing at? Right uh, Nebraska here. or South Dakota? Yeah, right. <laughs> My poor Minnesota. Hopefully our Minnesota viewers are still watching. We'll be back with more from late night. Um, so, so how are things? Um, things, things are good. Things are good, yeah, yeah. How are things with you? Oh, uh, good, good. That's good, that's good. late night. Now give it up for Stephanie Ann Johnson. King Jesus lit the candle by the water side to see them little children running to be baptized. Honor, honor unto the dying lamb. To see them little children running to be baptized On the altar unto the dying lamb So run alone, children, and be baptized Oh, there's a meeting by the water side On the
that was incredible. We've got another late night coming at you December 1st. Stay tuned for more from late night. This is incredible. I'm going to tell them all to stay here in a second. Stephanie is going to be playing more music if you want to hang around. I'm going to play a few more songs for you. All right. Oh, yeah. Take it away. Woo! Um, so we have a CD release party on the 10th of November. We will be in Seattle at the Fremont Act.